Welcome everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started in just a few minutes. Until then, if you wanna let me know what your favorite destination is, you can put that in the chat at the bottom of your screen or where you wanna to go to next. For those joining on Facebook, uh, you can go ahead and put some comment, um, your destinations in the comment field. We'll give it another minute or so. People are still jumping on, I can see. As the presentation goes through, you can always put some questions to um, me or to our panelists uh, in the chat also. We've got somebody joining us from here in State College. Where you do you want to go to next, Sarah? Oh, hi, Pat. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Once again, welcome to everybody. Um, this is our next installment of our Travel Spotlight. I'm Kelly Morganti, the Assistant Director of the Alumni Travel Program. As a reminder, this presentation is being recorded and all viewers joining us through Zoom are on mute. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom window and then clicking show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link, which you can find in the chat. Penn State Alumni Association has offered group travel for over 50 years. Each year, we work with some of the most experienced tour operators in Affinity Travel to compile a varied collection of tours visiting destinations around the globe. Details on all of our upcoming tours are available on our website, alumni.psu.edu backslash travel. One of the comments we hear often from our travelers is how much they enjoy having a Penn State representative on their tour. In 2023, we have already been fortunate to find four faculty that will accompany some of our groups. Dr. Peter Newman will be on the Wolves of Yellowstone. Dr. Gregory Drain will be on the Paris and African American Experience. Jared Frederick will um, be accompanying our easy company, England to Eagle's Nest World War II trip. And of course, Dr. Kirk French, the Heartland Journey Bourbon Experience River Cruise, who will be joining me shortly. We have received several questions from those who have pre-registered for today's event, and we will answer as many as we possibly can throughout the presentation. If you would like to submit any questions now, we invite you to do so via the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom window. Following the live event, you can submit any questions via email to alumnitravel at psu.edu. Let's start today off with Anita Root, Director of Product Development with Go Next. Hello, everyone from Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
And um, hey. thanks to Kelly. And I'm so excited to talk with all of you today and share what we think is going to be a fabulous trip in June of next year. So um, the, the departure itself is called Heartland Journey Bourbon Experience. This is aboard the American Queen um, Steamboat Company's uh, departure or the ship called the American Countess. And we'll talk a little bit about the Countess as well. And it starts in Louisville, goes to Memphis, and you can see the itinerary goes on the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers. Um, starting in uh, Louisville on June 4th and ending then on the 13th in Memphis. And some features of the program that we offer is a two night pre-cruise stay in Louisville at the historic Brown Hotel. And for those of you who know the Brown Hotel, it's quite fabulous. I've only stayed there once myself, but it's been a landmark in Louisville since 1923. And it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So two nights at that fabulous hotel in a very easy walking area to do some more exploring in downtown Louisville. And then we have a full day tour of uh, the Kentucky bourbon distilleries. We have three on our list. Bardstown Distillery, Maker's Mark, and Stitzel Weller Reserve. So during that one day trip, we would leave the hotel and make our way to each of these distilleries and having lunch at one and doing some tastings and having some fun along the way. And as I talk through this, we will have a $300 early booking savings that will be valid for all the all Penn State um, travelers on this departure. And when you look at the website, either the GoNex website or the branded website for Penn State, this will be um, taken at the time of the booking. So when Great. you look at the price, it probably isn't in there yet. It's when you do the transaction that the early booking savings arrives. Fantastic. All right. And then it will be seven uh, nights on board the American Countess. And this is a, just a beautiful picture of the lobby of the uh, Brown Hotel. So checking in on June 4th for two nights. And like I said, the three distilleries that we uh, endeavor to get to are Bardstown Distillery, and then Maker's Mark, and uh, Stitzel Weller Reserve. So three for the day. Very, very popular. Yes. And the American Countess itself is a, a fascinating ship. It, as you can see, it has a paddle wheel. It also has motors. So if, you know, something doesn't work quite well or it needs a little more um, engine power, with that is as well. But it's just a fabulous ship and has a lot of really unique components to it. And um, this ship was christened on uh, March 22nd of 2021. You know, COVID put a lot of things in a different play. But it was really quite exciting because it, because they have a, um, I think they have a board member or they have some oh. very deep ties to uh, Maker's Mark. The ship is not, the boat is not christened with um, champagne. It was christened with Maker's Mark. So we have a, a video to show. Absolutely perfect. Yes. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any audio on this, but um, that that's obviously they're talking about the christening and, and yes. inviting her up to to christen that with our the maker's mark. And then the person christening it, her name is Angie Hack, and she's the founder of American Queen Voyages daughter. Uh, oh, Queen wonderful. Daughter. So she gives it a good whack and boy, does it look fun. <laughs> Stand back. <laughs> I was going to say, everybody's looking a little leery here. <laughs> All right. There you go. And the whistle blows. <laughs> yes. OK, so what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about each of the stops after you embark the ship on June 6th. Uh, and then as you go down the river towards Memphis, the main format of an American Queen Voyages trip is as the as the boat docks into a city, there are a bunch of motor coaches that would pick people up and then they're able to do what's called a hop on hop off tour. Oh, good. And, and these are all included. And the, the best way that I've seen to do these is you get on in the morning and there generally is a hop on guide who lives from that area. And oh, then we're okay. able to tell all of these unique places that you just do a big circuit. And it, you know, if you wanna stop more here, you can. If you aren't so interested in a quilt museum, you go to the next place. But there's a bunch of places that you hop on, hop off. And these coaches just make a, a constant um, rotation in the morning. So you can get back on in 15 minutes and move on to the next place. So you really nice. can decide nice. what is interesting for you. And if you don't have much interest, then you just pass that stuff, stop up. 
and how it actually works then in the afternoon is if you really liked one of those locations, you go get back on the hop on hop off and there's just not a guide in the afternoon. It just kind okay. of makes the rotation. So the morning is nice to be able to hear what all the, the, the unique aspects are of each stop. And then the afternoon, you can do it on your own schedule as well. And every stop has these hop on hop offs. Yes. Yes. Everyone. And some of them even have other items, like if you wanted to do some premium excursions and those come at an additional price and okay. where I know those are on the, on the itinerary, I'll give some updates as well. Great. Great. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we leave Louisville on uh, Louisville on June 6th and we go to Madison, Indiana. And I'm okay. just going to look at my notes so I don't forget some of the exciting things. So the hop on hop off here has three main stops. One of them is a saddle tree factory. So this is the where the saddles sit, you know, on a, uh -huh. on a tree where these are made and how the um, how the industry kind of works for those. And okay. there's a historical fountain in the middle of town. And then there's a history center and railroad museum. So those are the oh. three stops for that day. Okay. In Madison. And next, oh, I'm sorry. And that day also has a premium excursion, a jet boat tour on the river. That's about $49. Oh, wow. So you could do the hop on hop off in the morning and do the jet boat tour in the afternoon. if you. Okay. Suppose. Okay. Plenty of time to do both. Exactly. And the next stop is Bradenburg, Kentucky. And this one is very iconic. This one doesn't have the traditional hop on hop off, okay. but it has, uh, you go to Hodgenville, Kentucky, and this is where the uh, President's Museum is for Abraham Lincoln. Oh. And how this works is it's included for everyone, but you have to kind of declare that you want to go, right? Okay. Some people might have went there before, maybe they're not interested. So how they make sure they know people are interested is they charge $50 to your room. And that's just okay. your declaration that you want to go. And if you travel and come back on, they take that off, right? It's just oh, okay. kind of a, a deposit. If okay. you say you're going to go and you know show, I believe you are charged the $50. Okay. So it's just so they know how many people are going to go on that. That's the and only they, time. Mm -hmm. And they can declare that before they travel or while on board? While on board as well, yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yes. And that's the only one that's very unique because, uh, because it's just the one thing to do um, off the ship that day. Oh, okay, okay. The other exploration would be on your own. Okay, all right. The next stop is Owensboro, Kentucky. And the hop on hop off here has a botanical garden, the Western Kentucky Botanical Garden, the okay. Owensboro Music um, Museum and Hall of Fame. Oh. Um, and, and it has a Museum of Fine Arts and a Bluegrass Music Hall of Fame as well. Nice. So four stops there. And next is to Henderson, Kentucky. There's a historic depot, uh, a Carnegie Public Library, and the John James Audubon State Park. And um, there's also a, a, a museum, a historical museum uh, attached to John, uh, John James Audubon as well. Oh, okay. Okay, that's in Henderson, Kentucky. Okay. All right. And then when you get to Paducah, there is a premium excursion in the afternoon, and it's called the Check In Along the Chitlin Trail. And this is a safe haven, uh, a trail of safe haven that was for the African American mu musicians that went through oh. the part of the country. And Back there's from the New Marine Orleans Act. up to Chicago, probably. Right. And there's a lot of history about B.B. King, Ike and Tina Turner, and Billie Holiday at the start. Oh, wonderful. So that's the premium. And the okay. hop on, hop off in the morning is the National Quilt M Museum. Um, there's a, an art district, a lower town art district. There's some flood wall murals from when floods went through there and then they use those walls to make very uh, colorful murals. There's um, the railroad museum there. There's a discovery center and the Lloyd Tillman house, which is like a very uh, Greek revival house as I read up on it. That's also another nice stop. So this oh, okay. is very full for the morning, four or five stops and then the premium in the afternoon to, the, um, to see the musical piece. Oh, great, okay. And then we go to New Madrid, Missouri. And this has a historical museum. Um, there's an old school. And then there's a state historical site that has some, uh, as I read up on this, it's more history about a family that was very prominent there and how they um, worked with their slaves. They had a lot of slaves. And um, then how they um, uh, went into the next part of that century into, oh. into changing. But it, it seems like it's a very fascinating tour in New Madrid. And that's New Madrid, not, not Madrid, like we're always seeing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. 
And then after that, we arrive in Memphis. And there's two things that can happen when you get to Memphis. We usually, um, the ship, the boat pulls in at around eight o'clock in the morning and you could disembark and make your way uh, home early in the morning. Or you could say, I'd really like to go check out the Elvis experience and then take my transfer to the airport. And I believe that's around $79 and takes you to Graceland and things like that. And you would just leave Memphis much later in the day in the late, late afternoon. Okay, so then when when um, people are arranging airline uh, reservations, so that's something they want to think about ahead of yes. time. Yes, and as I talk through this, um, when I get into the ex- inclusions later, there is an air option um, now offered with American Queen for four hundred and ninety nine dollars. Oh, that we can add on. So if you wanted someone else to take care of your air needs, we could do that. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, that that that's really handy when you're trying to set up flight arrangements. As- especially as crazy as setting up flight arrangements are right now. Right. And some people might want to use airline miles or things like that. So they have the option for both. Fantastic. All right. And then that's disembarkation on June 13th. So once you're on the boat, and I'm sorry that I keep calling it a ship, I would be in a lot of (laughs) trouble if the American Queen um, Steamboat Company heard me say this, but it is a boat. Um, So I just have some icons here that show you what's included in this this program. So it's two nights at the pre-cruise hotel, and this is the brown, as I mentioned. And then we offer that they include the transfer between the hotel and bringing you to to the boat. Okay. So when you land in Louisville, there won't be a transfer that's included that brings you to the Brown Hotel. That would be up to the traveler. Okay. And the unlimited guided tours are these hop-on, hop-offs that I mentioned that are offered at each um, spot. There's beverages on board. There's an open bar at the lounges. Okay. The the menu is very, very nice. There's in these different venues, there's some, they try to bring on fresh food from the local regions. There's always USDA beef and lobster and more catfish. Don't forget the catfish. Catfish, more than you could eat in a day, but it's wonderful. You could also eat in your room if you so choose. Wi-Fi. Uh, there's a daily onboard entertainment in the in the lounge, and there are bicycles and walking sticks as well. Okay. And of course, the visits to the distillery are also included. Yes, as part of the two-night pre-cruise stay. Yes. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I love cruising, and you know, this is a great combination of comfort and elegance and a quieter lifestyle, you know, on, on these river boats. Um, and again, sweet tea and fried catfish. I don't know that we can make it more enticing except for to add bourbon to the mix. <laughs> right, exactly. And the, Amer- and the American Countess, there are actually three stateroom categories that mm-hmm. are for double occupancy. And there are even single staterooms. So oh. I believe one of your travelers, potential travelers was asking about a single stateroom. And yep. those are intended only for a single traveler. And those okay. are available as well. And pricing on that is all going to be on our website. Correct. Correct. Right. And when you Fantastic. look at the price, it's probably before the three hundred dollar discount. If you right. remember that, okay. Right. Do we have a date for that three hundred dollar? Do we know when that's um, how long that is good for? I believe it will go for bookings through uh, towards the end of December, right before Christmas, right. December. 20th. Okay, fantastic. So people still have a little bit of time left. Right. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. And then the cruise, it's, the cruise itself is fabulous, but it's only put up a notch when we add the bourbon content that uh, Dr. French is going to talk about. So it's great that we take people and they see the three distilleries in Louisville, but to understand more of the, the history of the region, I think just wraps it all up and makes this a trip of a lifetime. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. French now, and I want to go on this trip with you. So yeah, we all do. We were talking about this yesterday. Um, So yeah, let's go ahead and bring on uh, Dr. Kirk French, uh, award-winning professor, an Emmy-nominated filmmaker, which is something fairly new, um, and a creator of the largest anthropology class in the United States, the Anthropology of Alcohol. Hi, Kirk. How are you today? I'm pretty good. I'm here in my personal bar that we built during COVID because, well, it's you could. <laughs> and so, uh, so here, here I am. Welcome to, to Texas Bar uh, in Pine Grove Mills, Pennsylvania, just outside of just a few miles from Penn State. Um, so, yeah, booze and culture. Um, thanks uh, for uh, for mentioning that. I Yes, the class is the largest anthropology class in the United States, and I like to think it's because Penn State students love anthropology so much. Absolutely, that's absolutely. What that's about. Um, and you have almost seven hundred students a semester. 
726. It fills up the largest classroom on campus. So uh, Wow. Wow. Well, let's just go ahead. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about the class. Oh, well, the class is just um, each lecture is a different part of the world, a different culture or a different geographical location. Um, little history of may maybe when humans first moved into that place. Let's say it's I just gave a lecture yesterday on Mongolia. And so, you know, Homo erectus moves in there around 850,000 years ago modern humans 40,000 years ago there's cave paintings and all that stuff and then horse nomadic culture moves in there around 5,000 BC and then we talk about that and then their alcohol of choice is fermented horse milk called arag and then I actually have some arag there that we milked from Penn State horses and then they okay. get to smell that and all that so it's it's looking at it's looking at anthropology through the lens of alcohol and okay. just really an introduction to alcohol and an introduction to alcohol, an introduction to anthropology <laughs> through uh, through talking about alcohol. So, um, so yeah, I, I say, you know, it's, it's just take a shot of anthropology. So that's kind of what Great. It's that's fantastic. <clears throat> All right. So am I in control of this thing here? I uh, think so. No, I don't think Not so. Yet. Not yet. Unless I'm doing something wrong, I've only had two and a half years to get used to Zoom. So I know, you know, I, I we we keep trying to tell everybody that we're we're great at this virtual um, component, and then you know something. But well, we'll go ahead and and just go ahead and advance the slides for you. Okay. So if uh, oh, it looks like I can do it now. Oh, you can. Okay, great. I think so yes, I can. Okay, great. Okay, so. Hey, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, what I'm going to do here, maybe 20, 25 minutes, roughly, I just want to kind of give a little overview of the, the kind of really unprecedented role um, that alcohol played in, played in the United States and the formation of the United States. I'm going to talk a little bit about bourbon, uh, and then I'll end it with talking a little bit about my moonshine archaeology project. That okay. I, so, so we'll start off with alcohol in the United States. I'll go into each of these a little more detail, but we'll talk about early European settlers, the Whiskey Rebellion that happened right here in Pennsylvania, um, how income tax uh, in 1913 played a role, the 18th Amendment, which was prohibition, the 21st Amendment we'll talk about ever so briefly. And then I just want to mention, you know, there's over a trillion dollars a year that are spent worldwide on alcohol sales, but 210 billion annually just in the United States. So oh it is an enormous, uh, it plays an enormous role in our in our daily lives. If you're a drinker or not, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, so, okay, now I'm, I've lost control again. Hmm. The slides. Okay, there we go. Um, just start off with the, with the Mayflower, right? The Pilgrims. Okay, so you don't think, okay, they're you know, searching for religious freedom, but we don't know exactly what, we don't have a list of exactly what was on the Mayflower when it came over, but we do have lists of what was recommended, the suggested provisions that were giving to the passengers, those, those 135 passengers that came over from, uh, from Plymouth, England to the New World in 1620. And of those of the, the list, three of them are alcohol. One is beer, one is cider, and one is aquavita. So aquavita, of course, is Latin for water of life. And that means whiskey. And the okay. reason that means whiskey is because whiskey actually comes from the Gaelic word, a whiskeba, which means water of life. And so a whiskeba was morphed into whiskey. And that's why we call it whiskey is because okay. it's the water of life. So, um, so Aquavita. So they're suggesting everyone bring some cider and some, some whiskey and some beer uh, along Stay with well, that. well hydrated. Exactly. Um, okay. The whiskey rebellion. You want to say just a few things about that mainly because it happened here in Pennsylvania, but also because what happened is that you know, we were in a lot, the United States was in a lot of debt after the American Revolution, after the Revolutionary War. And in 1791, a whiskey tax is put on uh, distilled spirits, not on beer, just distilled spirits. And it, this went on for several years and the people in far Western Pennsylvania, out near where Pittsburgh is today, um, they were using whiskey like a lot of people did back in that time as a as a currency, 
You know, I mean, you, you have your corn or your rye or whatever that you have, and you can store that. Mice are going to get some of it. You're going to lose a lot of it to rot or whatever. But if you distill it, you have it. It's easy, more easily transportable and mm-hmm. you use it to buy other things. And so essentially you're taxing this, this form of exchange that they have. And the unfairness of it was that distilleries, that people that had a lot of money that actually had distilleries, they were being taxed less per gallon than the little guy that was making just a few gallons at a time. And it was unfair. So okay. people with, with less were being taxed heavier. People with more were being taxed less. Sound familiar? <laughs> uh, it's a thing that just continues on, right? Um, and so the people in Western Pennsylvania said we've had enough. They ended up, you know, um, what they ended up doing was uh, capturing and surrounding a, um, if we can go to the next slide, please. They, they um, captured a, a, a tax inspector and they surrounded it. And this, this led over like three years of this kind of building. But in 1794, when this all blew up, the US Marshal arrived and then they ended up sending out 13,000 militia, militiamen out to this area. So George Washington sends people out from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland. <clears throat> they all, these militiamen go out. And so here's the thing. This is the first battle after the revolution, this is the first battle America as a brand new country got into after the Revolutionary War. What was it about? It was about booze. It was about whiskey and it was about taxes. Um, if we could go to the, to the next slide. Um, so what this showed though, only a few people died. Um, I think three, um, okay. there were several people that were, a lot of people were arrested and most of them were pardoned. One of them was Wiggle, if you've ever had any Wiggle whiskey, uh, which is a big Pennsylvania whiskey um, named after uh, a Wiggle that was involved in this. But also one of the one of the militiamen as well was uh, Meriwether Lewis that was a part of this that that went out to help quell this this down. But what it showed was that this was a brand new country, a very it's an experiment. It's it's weak in many ways. Is it going to survive? Who knows if this was going to work or not? This showed that it worked. This showed that without, with very little bloodshed, they were able to quell uh, an uprising and it continued on. The other thing the Whiskey Rebellion did is it actually contributed to the formation of political parties. What this really boiled down to was big government, small government, taxes, no taxes. Those same issues that we're still talking about and debating today, they start right here with the Whiskey Rebellion right here in Pennsylvania. Who knew? And that was actually in Monongahela. If I, if, if one of our, um, yeah. one of our contributors today was just put it in the chat that it was from her hometown. Yeah, it's right outside of Bridgeport or Bridge, Bridgeville, I think, just south of uh, Pittsburgh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. And so that leads. I, I want to say a few more things about taxes because this is what the ta- this is what the Whiskey Rebellion was all about. It's about taxes. And also, I want to say too that. that this was the first domestic product that was taxed. It was alcohol. Now, this tax continued on, and Thomas Jefferson repealed it in 1802. We had a war of 1812. We taxed alcohol again to help pay for it. It was repealed in 1834. Then the Civil War happened. We got in really big debt again. Taxes came on strong, and they lasted until 1913. And I want to bring up this really important part point that has to do with prohibition, because by 1890, 40% of the U.S. government's income came from alcohol tax. Wow. That's, that's 40%. So no matter if you want to do away with alcohol or not, you couldn't. It was impossible. You can't do away with alcohol because most, almost, almost half of your income for your uh, government, what it runs on, is coming from alcohol taxes. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so this leads to, pro, you know, just to talk about prohibition, prohibition had been going strong for a while right. in Scandinavia and in, in different parts of the world, but also here, Maine outlawed it completely in 1851. Oh, wow. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was pushing it in 18, when they formed in 1873. You know, the women's suffrage movement had a lot to do with prohibition, but also had a lot to do with rights that women ended up getting. If it was, I mean, prohibition has its nasty side, but it also has its silver linings as well. And some of those silver linings are things like the, the women's suffrage movement right. that really uh, built a lot of, of camaraderie and uh, cohesion during that time period. And it gave women something to fight for in, a, in another sense, because they were depending on men to work in many regards, and they couldn't because they were drunk. And so it really, 
it, it really uh, helped to, to solidify a lot of different movements. Kansas outlaws it in 1881. This is all building, but the thing is, you can't do it on a government level. You, the federal government can't do away with it. They depend on the taxes too much. But in 1913, the 16th Amendment was passed. It replaced the alcohol tax with the federal income tax. So all of a sudden, you're taxing people's income. You don't really need it anymore. So just a few years later, prohibition happens because now it's actually possible. What also helped it helped it happen, because when you think about it, I'll say a few more things about prohibition here in a moment, but when you think about how a crazy experiment that it was to actually take law-abiding citizens and make them criminals essentially overnight, um, what led to all this? What was all the things I've been talking about? And then World War I had just happened. And there was a lot of anti-German sentiment that was going on. And all of the beer manufacturers were German. And so it was easy to hate the, the you know, the, the German uh, beer manufacturers because of what was going on in World War I. So that played a role as well. So if we go to the next slide here. Um, so the 18th, just a few years later after the 16th Amendment, December 1917, House and Senate approved constitutional amendment. And let me just say what has to happen if, in case you're a little rough on your civics. Two thirds of the Senate and two thirds of the House have to approve this. And then when that's done, it has to be approved and ratified by two thirds of all the states. So 36 of the then 48 states made it law on January 16th, 1919. And I'm just saying the color of the sky getting two thirds of any of <laughs> we, there's no way that would happen today. So right. we haven't had an amendment in a long time. Right. <laughs> then the Volstead Act, which you might have heard of before, but what happened there is this was just legislation that allowed the enforcement of the 18th Amendment. It allowed for money to flow to actually enforce it. So that's why you've heard about the Volstead Act. But January 17th, 1920 is the day it begins. And I've read a little bit about it. January 16th, 1920 was one big party. <laughs> uh, people were drinking it all, you know. Um, so, but the thing is, it was a total failure in almost every single way. Speakeasies blew up, organized crime. What's happening is things that you weren't normally around, like organized crime, like gambling or prostitution, things like that. Well, now those same people that controlled gambling and prostitution, they're also in control of alcohol. So if you want alcohol, you've got to go to the same people in the same places that are dealing with this other illegal activity. So everything, corruption really explodes, crime, uh, murder rates, drunk driving rates go through the roof, and then a lot of job loss. And obviously, I mean, yeah, we have the we have the income tax now, but there is still a lot of tax loss because there's no alcohol to tax. And I got to hand it to some people. Um, you know, we get set in our ways uh, yeah. as we get older. And even if you're almost proven wrong, it's really hard to change your stance on something. But a lot of people did change their stance. And John D. Rockefeller is one. This quote from him is, he says, when prohibition was introduced, I hoped it would be widely supported and with public opinion. And the day would come that the evil effects of alcohol would be recognized. But instead, he slowly and reluctantly came to believe that this was not the result. Drinking had increased. The speakeasy had replaced the saloon, a place where people used to gather and right. discuss things. Now it was a speakeasy. And people are disrespecting the law and they just ignored it completely. And he feels like that he knows that crime has increased and he was absolutely against prohibition after about nine years in. And uh, and so anyway, you know, well, it's just funny that drunk driving increased with the restriction of alcohol. Yeah, because you got to, because you're going to go somewhere and you're going to drink more because you're going to go to this one location that has it. You're going to drink more and then you got to get home. Right. There's only right. certain places that have it having it and taking it back to your house would be maybe even riskier. So, right. um, so FDR comes in with his cape. Uh, one of the things he was elected on his platform was, it's there in the Great Depression, Come put people back to work. One of the things, if we could undo, if we can undo this 18th Amendment and prohibition, we could put a lot of people back to work from farmers to, to, to brewers, to drivers, to all of this, right? Bar owners. Right. So just a few weeks, two weeks after he was elected um, on March 20, or after he was um, uh, the inauguration, March 22nd, 1933, he signed an amendment to the Volstead Act to at least allow the manufacturer 3.2% beer. And you know, when they all have these bunch of pens and they sign, they sign all this stuff, um, they have like six pens, they sign over and over again. The rumor has it that what he says he signed it was, I think this will be a time for a good beer. And so, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. So he he says this and, and signs this, and immediately Budweiser, Anheuser Busch, and everybody's rolling trucks out the next morning with 3.2 percent beer. And then another miraculous thing happened. One, it's the, actually this is crazier than prohibition, because the only time we ever had, we had to an, amend an amendment was because of alcohol. And so here we go again, two thirds of the house, two thirds of the Senate and two thirds of the states all approve within record time, repeal this thing right now. And the 21st amendment made it all go away. We can't and, move that fast on anything these days. Oh my gosh, I know. Um, but one thing I wanna say about that too is that you know the slate was clean on states and what they would do with alcohol. So if you've ever wondered why Pennsylvania has such archaic and weird alcohol laws or Oklahoma does, or if you, the ones that have more liberal alcohol laws and those that have more conservative alcohol laws, it's about who was in power when that happened. So oh, okay. Pincho, um, which was great for conservation forest was a teetotaler and he has quoted Pennsylvania governor as saying, I am going to make it as hard and as expensive for Pennsylvanians to drink alcohol if this is what we have to do. And that is why you have to sometimes go to three or four different locations to get what you need for a, for a little bit together. Uh, okay. there's, there's a lot of surrounding states that have much um, more lax yeah. rules. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I wanna say a few things about bourbon, not a whole lot, because hopefully you're gonna come along on this and you're gonna learn a whole lot about it, but um, we can go to the next slide here. I just wanna say what bourbon is. You know, bourbon, it, it has federal standards that was put in place in 1962 or 64. I can't remember, but I do know it's May 4th because May the 4th be with you. So <laughs> May 4th, I think it was 1962. The federal standards were put in place. Bourbon, it has to be pr produced in the U.S. It can okay. be produced outside the U.S. And it doesn't okay. have to be Kentucky. That's a big misnomer that it has to be Kentucky. Um, has to be made from grain that is at least 51% corn. Everything after the 51% is what creates a lot of the differences with the different bourbons. Uh, aged in new charred oak barrels uh, for a minimum of two years, and then entered into the barrel no more than 62.5 ABV, bottled at, uh, 80, at 80 proof or more. And so those, those five uh, stipulations, if you can do that anywhere in the United States, then you can make yourself a bourbon. And um, just to say something about Maker's Mark real quick, because we're going to Maker's Mark, if you like Maker's Mark, one of the things I like about it is it's got a little tinge of sweetness to it. And that comes from the red winter wheat that's actually uh, mixed in. Of course, all these are secrets of how much rye, how much red winter wheat goes with it, uh, or how much corn. It could have 60% corn. We don't know. We know it at least has 51% because it has to. But um, Maker's Mark is really special to me. And I just want to bring this up because we can go to the next slide. Listen, I... This is my, well, this is a few years ago. This is my daughter, Viola. We went to the Maker's Mark Distillery. That's there in Loretto, Kentucky, where we will, will all be going. And we went, we're driving through Kentucky. We did a little bourbon tour. She had, she had more fun than I did. Um, and playing in the barrels and swimming in the mash and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm joking. Um, so go to the next slide here. And one of the things you're going to get to do that I, I didn't even know this when I went there is you get to dip your own barrel. Look at this. And if you see my own label, look at this. It says Kirk and Laurel on it right there. Kirk and Laurel, we got our own barrel. We got a bunch of these. That's your wife, correct? Yes, my wife, Laurel. Yeah, so we got our own bottles. We got about five of these, but you get to dip them. If we go to the next slide, you're actually gonna get to dip this down into the, uh, to the hot wax and Dip your very own Maker's Mark, bo Maker's Mark bottle. Wow. I'm going to take it just a tad bit further here and just really hit it home how much I like Maker's Mark. Years ago, before we had uh, before we had Biola, we'd gone to Maker's Mark for a, another tour, just the two of us. And we had this really great photo that was taken of us in front of the still. And I decided to have it framed for a, oh, an anniversary present or something like that. So I had it framed. And I called Maker's Mark and said, hey, can I send you this frame and will you dip it? So look, they sent this, they dipped this, this, uh, this, this picture of us. Frame. In frame, frame into the wax. And this hangs on our wall. This is a, so am, am I, I swear you probably think I work for Maker's Mark. I don't <laughs> Mark, well, you looked very happy holding both your daughter and, and that bottle. So, so I think that you have a connection with them. 
And I do. I've noticed sometimes I hold a bottle sometimes like a baby, a baby bottle. Yeah, it's like it's it's very similar. Um, OK, so we can go on to the next slide. Bourbon, it's, it's history. It's very unclear on the date, but it's most likely the 1780s. And, and what happens here, just to kind of keep this really brief, is that um, you know, when you distill alcohol, any kind of alcohol, it's clear when it comes out, okay? The, the coloring comes from aging it. It comes from oh. the barrel. And so what most likely happened in Bourbon County is they're, they're making whiskey, just clear whiskey, unaged whiskey, because that's what everybody made. But everything was stored in barrels. And so if you're, you know, you can get new oak barrels. Okay. Um, they're expensive if you're talking about trying to cut things on the cheap, or you can reuse barrels. And if you reuse a barrel that like say pickles were in or olive oil was in or something like that, that stuff's gonna soak into that barrel. You need to burn that out. And so they would char the inside of the barrels of used wow. barrels so that they could get rid of the vinegar, the pickles smell or whatever that was soaked into it. Whatever residue. Right, get rid of that. And then they put their clear whiskey in there it leaves Bourbon County, stamped Bourbon County. It gets put on a on a boat, a river boat, a barge, and it makes its way down to New Orleans. It takes okay. about three months or so, and it ages just a little bit. And then what's coming out the other end is a different color, a caramel color. It's a little bit smoother, and everyone starts asking, going back north, we want more of that stuff coming from Bourbon County. What's going on? And they realize that actually charring it is making some sort of a difference. Okay. So that's really where bourbon, you know, comes from. It's like most things. It's just an accidental discovery. Uh, you know, and I, you're just kind of screwing up and it turns out to be an amazing discovery. Um, but bourbon, bourbon is not named after Bourbon Street in New Orleans or anything like that. They're all named after um, uh, the house, the Royal House of Bourbon, uh, French aristocrats that were part of the Revolutionary War. Um, oh. and, that had had some land and stuff in Kentucky. And then of course they had were part of the founding of, of early New Orleans too, when the French owned it. So that's okay. where it comes from. Did All not right. know that. And so lastly, just want to say, you know, from a from a scholarly standpoint in the in regards to archaeology, because I am as a I'm an anthropologist, but you know, my main uh, area of expertise within anthropology is archaeology. And so uh, years ago, uh, this was the pilot project in 2013, I decided, you know, I wanted to learn more about uh, trying to quantify how much moonshine was being made in a particular area. And so you can't look at historical records because no one is keeping track of illegal activity in <laughs> notebooks, right? You can't go to the, you know, you can figure out how much sugar was being sold because you could look at taxes in different areas, but you can't look at this. So as an archeologist, what we would do is we would do a survey an archaeological survey in a particular area to see what kinds of artifacts we could find to try and get a rough quantification of how much was there. So we went out and uh, as a pilot project, we found, uh, my wife and I found four moonshine stills in just a few days. Wow. Um, uh, doing transects up and down uh, streams. And so if we go to the next slide, um, and actually, I'm sorry, can you go back for just a second? That photograph, just to say something about it, this is actually a, a it's called a, a still furnace. It's what the furnace, I mean, it's, it's what the pot still sits on top of with the fire underneath it. And oh. so that's the, it's like a horseshoe shape, right? That you would set a big, you know, container on top of to cook it so that you can cook your mash so you can make your, your, your whiskey. And so we, that's the kind of thing that we were locating. And then little pieces of, of, of barrels and, um, and pot stills uh, that were, that had probably exploded that were still left out there. And, uh, and do you have a time frame when you think those came from? Well, most of those would have come from around Prohibition time. Okay. Um, so, you know, in, in 1920s, 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, we did this in Western North Carolina. There's a lot of small streams out there. Um, it's really known for its moonshine history. Um, so that was one of the main reasons for going out there. Um, you can go to the next slide. And this one area that we really focused on was the Catalucci Valley, which is just on the very edge of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park on the North Carolina side, just over the border. Long history of European settlement. Uh, there's still some, a lot of old growth forest, which means there's not a lot of disruption out there with on the landscape. Um, a lot of Scots Irish settlers that are moving into that area. That means they're bringing with them the knowledge of whiskey production from Scotland and Ireland. And so, and, and the mineral content of the water, the pH levels are perfect for making whiskey. So that's why I chose that particular area. Okay. 
And here's some more stuff, just still pots that we found out there. Most of these had been blown up, probably blown up by revenue officers that had found people making moonshine and they, they dynamite them and blow them to pieces so they can't be, they can't be reused. Okay. Um, and then here's some more um, uh, still furnaces. Like I was talking about, you can kind of see that, that horseshoe shape uh, that's left. So most of the stuff they're going to take with them, that stuff's valuable. The copper pot, all the other equipment, the condenser, all that stuff you can reuse. You're not going to break down the still furnace. You're just going to leave it there. And that leaves this indelible mark on the landscape that archaeologists like myself can come, come along and find later. Okay. Some, some of the wooden barrels were gone, but we found many of the, the, the metal bands that hold the barrels together. Uh, we found some, quite a few of those out there. And in June 2017, we went down there. I took four students. Um, we went down there and did some more surveys. A lot of archival research at the library, looking at things like copper sales and sugar sales, arrest records, things like that. But what we really focused on, uh, because we were having some issues with other things from the archaeological standpoint, um, uh, with problems with the, uh, the national parks and several little, little issues that we, I won't get into, it was recording the oral histories that we ended up focusing more time on. It became the more rewarding aspect of it. Um, and so we interviewed a lot of people about their viewpoints of moonshine. We inter interviewed people that still make uh, moonshine today. And um, yeah, and, and, and you know, their viewpoint of, of, of what it was like during prohibition what, for, for their grandparents or for their parents, just collecting stories, oral histories. And um, it was really fun. We went to some nursing homes and, uh, and took some and, and, and filmed some people. And so if we go to the next slide, um, uh, put together a video. Um, my students and I uh, filmed this, and then one of my students um, edited this together. This called Community Survival and the Art of Liquor Making. It's about eight minutes long, okay. and um, he ended up getting nominated for an Adobe Prize um, for this film. Uh, it didn't win, but it made it to the semifinals. Uh, we were really proud of it, and it's going to, the link is going to be somewhere. They're going to put it there if you guys want to watch it later. It's just on YouTube. Um, it's just eight minutes long, and it's a little thing that we did about whatever it was, six, seven years ago, COVID's made me lose track of time. So I know, um, I know. we did, we did put a link um, to that video in the chat. We're also going to include it in the survey that we'll send out to all of our viewers afterwards. So they'll be able to take a look at that later on. Um, one of our viewers has some history of her own. She says her grandmother made and sold moonshine in, in Western Pennsylvania. Um, we, I'm sure that we could probably get her to talk with us a little bit about that. That would be great. So, but and I personally think that I just need to come take your class. I mean, it, it sounds fabulous to me. Well, I, um, I can understand why it is so popular. Um, it's such a great topic, and of course, what a better way to learn and see um, to learn more about this and to see um, your research than to do so in the comfort of the newly reconstructed American countess. Let's go ahead and bring Anita back on to answer a couple questions um, with Kirk and I. And there she is. I do um, want to say one thing though. I, I mm -hmm. that christening thing. I don't know if anybody else was upset about it, but it, I mean, I that was one point seven five liters <laughs> of really nice bourbon, and I know the shit. I know the boat was worth it, but um, <laughs> that really broke my heart. Um, so I just, I, I'm just. I'm still. I will relay your information. <laughs> We'll put that link in You're the like survey crying. too in case anybody wants to watch that again, since we were having a little bit of an audio issue with that, but we'll go ahead and put that link in the survey also. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a little bit um, d distressful. Um, <laughs> I, can, I can say that. Um, somebody else said that the christening brought tears to their eyes. So, so I think you're, you're, you're in good company with that one. Um, we do have a couple questions that were submitted by um, those who pre-registered for this event. Um, that we'll go through. Some of them are for Anita. Some of them um, are, for, I think Kirk was going to be a best one to answer. Um, Mohammed was asking, what is the cost of the travel um, for this trip? Now, I know we have different categories, but yes. what, is the, what is the starting cost of this? The trip? starting cost for an inside stateroom is $28.99. That's before the $300 discount that I mentioned. And okay. then there's two other room categories that then have outside staterooms, so outside okay. um, views. And those would be $44.99 or $49.99 before that $300. Okay. And that does not include the air, but they can get the air in Correct. included. Um, they just have to, it's what you said is $4.99? $4.99 from 30 cities that are offered throughout the U.S. And okay. if, it, 
if someone wants to go from a city other than that, then there might be an add-on if, it, okay. if it's more than four ninety nine. dollars so this right. is and they can just put all that on their reservation form once they, where right. they want to fly out of and everything. Right. And then right. as I, I think one of your travelers too asked about a single, uh, like okay. if they were a single traveler uh -huh. and single travelers are certainly welcome. Uh, a lot of times cruise ships make you pay while you're taking the room, you can pay two for both beds and you just right. pay twice as much as anyone else. But this uh, boat actually has some single categories and those start at $49.99. Okay, great, great. Um, this one I think is for Kirk. What is the difference between a rye based and a wheat based bourbon? Um, well, mainly the difference is, is that after that 51% corn, it's up mm -hmm. to the, to the distiller, to the maker to, to do whatever they want. And so if they want to keep it really heavy rye, then they might put another, they, that, the, it might go 20 to 30% rye. So it might be 51% corn, then 20 or 30% rye, and then a sprinkling of other things, right? So oh, in other words, okay. your other 50% or your other 49% is going to be heavy with another type of grain, be it okay. wheat, be it, uh, you know, um, um, rye, whatever it is. And that's what's, so when they say kind of um, a high wheat bourbon or a high rye bourbon, they just mean that other 49% is, there's a lot more rye. There's a lot of rye in it or a lot of wheat. Okay. Um, Abigail and Elaine wanted to know what is your favorite bourbon and distillery? Are they the same? Um, well, for bourbon, I mean, like, I mean, I really like Maker's Mark, but part of that's just, part of it's just personal, like, a, you know, it's, it's sentimental, but then there's also its price point is really good. Like it's one of the better bourbons for that particular price. Okay. Um, if it was just like, if I could spend whatever I wanted, um, you know, I mean, and what I get, like when I'm kind of celebrating something, I really like Blanton's a lot. And, but that's, that's 55, 58, 60 bucks for a, a, a fifth, you know, that's kind okay. of, kind of outside of my price range most times, but I really do like, uh, like Blanton's a lot. Okay. Okay. Um, we did answer the, whether you have to share a room, you can get some, there are some rooms on board that are uh, specifically set out for singles. Um, one of the questions was, can non-alumni partners join the cruise? Absolutely. Um, we usually have them knowing exactly what to say when somebody yells, we are by the end of the trip. But yes, we will take non-Penn Staters with us on, on these trips. Um, right. So that is allowed. And on um, the American Countess, if I could just say real quickly, mm -hmm. is yep. um, go next. Um, we obtain a, like maybe about half of the ship is what we, half of the boat, oh, I keep calling the ship, half of the boat, <laughs> and we sell into that block for a, for a discreet amount of time, and that's okay. this date that goes until mid-December, and okay. we sell it to Penn State, there may be other alumni groups on there, and yeah. there might be other people that are not affiliated with any of those alumni that are individual travelers, so you'll meet others from different alumni groups, and then others who are not part of the, the Go Next family um, on, the, on the departure as well. Okay, great. Um, there is another, so um, Wendy wants to know what is a double barreled bourbon and how is that different from straight bourbon? So a, a double barrel bourbon is uh, any double barrel whiskey at all um, or, or double barrel anything. There's double barrel tequilas, all sorts of things. What that just means is that it's aged in one particular barrel and then they're taking it out of that barrel so for bourbon, it would, after it's two years, it's going to be aged and they can remove it from that barrel and they put it into another barrel to let it age longer. And what that means is it's going to change the, the flavor, the flavor is going to change, right? The taste is going to change because it's going to be mixing with a fresh barrel, a freshly charred barrel or a different type of barrel, something that, you know, a, it's flavored with something else that's been used. Okay. So that's what it is. It's just using two barrels to end up to in your aging process. Okay. Um, and I think the last, so it was, uh, somebody's asking if they can bring a picture frame and have it dipped. I don't know. We can certainly ask for you. Um, I will ask. I'm I putting that on my list. Okay. I, I will ask. Find out that they didn't, um, they, they, I did find out when I was there that they didn't dip it. They, of course, of course, right. They have like a hot glue gun kind of thing. Right. So when I thought they dipped it, I was like, man, this, they must have a giant vat of this wax. 
And they were like, well, no, we have a glue. Of course they have a glue gun. Of course they right. have every kind of thing they want. So they use some sort of glue gun to run along the top of it. Uh, oh, okay. Which doesn't sound near as cool as dipping it. But no, we're just going to go with they dipped it. We're, right. we'll just, we'll go with that philosophy. And yesterday when I was verifying that everybody does get to dip the bottle, just like, um, like Kirk mentioned, they said that we may ask in advance, like maybe everybody who signs up, we might check in a month before and ask, well, how many bottles might you want to dip? just so they can be prepared for the amount of time we're there. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, because that's true, because we did that too. We had reserved five or six mm -hmm. bottles, liters, and they had them ready for us, uh, you know, already pre-purchased. So they had them there. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, we can certainly do that. We can make arrangements for that. Um, somebody commented that they're, the Maker's 46 is delicious. That's true. So it is. If we're going back to, to who likes what bourbon, we have some bourbon drinkers joining us today, I can tell. So, um, and then I think the last question we have is kind of a, I think this is a Kirk question. Um, are bourbons different based on the county that they're distilled in? Oh, well, so I, I thought it was country, uh, county. No, I mean, they're just gonna be different based on many different factors. I mean, like um, how it's aged, right? Okay. The, the level of charring that goes into it. So it's really not, and the location can matter because of the, the water. The water okay. plays a big role. And so different mineral content, different pH levels and things like that can make a difference. But also the type of still they use, the shape okay. of the still, that makes a difference in, in, uh, in, in how it's capturing the evaporated alcohol and, and how quickly it's condensed. All those things, all those things play a role. So not necessarily different based on geography, but I guess so with water, yeah. But quality of the raw materials, all of those things are gonna are, are gonna affect it. Okay. Yeah, I talked with one of our local distilleries here in the uh, State College area, and and they are very proud of the water that they use. Um, so I figure the water probably has a little bit to say yeah. on that. Yeah. So, but uh, well, that seems to be most of our questions. I think we've hit um, all of them. Um, of course, if there are any other questions afterwards, anybody can can email us here at alumni travel. Um, at psu.edu. Um, but otherwise, that seems to be it for today. I know that we're running out of time. I want to again thank Kirk and Anita so much for taking the time to join us and all the great information that they shared. Um, I'm sure that Kirk will be sharing more stories and information on board. Um, I think we have several people who want to come take your class. You may have to do just an alumni class for us at some point in time. We, um, we may be able to fill that 700, that 700 <laughs> um, uh, auditorium for you. Um, we should, we should do a lecture on a football weekend. That's just we should. We should. Maybe, maybe we can, you know, maybe for our reunion weekend, yeah. we can set I mean, something I'm my up. Tailgate, my tailgate archaeology project where we excavated out into the tailgating areas. So oh, yeah, really? we could like, yeah, we should do that. And that sounds like a good time. We're going to have to send some information out on that. Sign me up for that one for sure. All right. So, um, you know, I hope uh, um, everybody. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. I saw one question on the Q&A part, not the chat. Uh, Karen oh, okay. asked, as a host on this uh, tour, will uh, Dr. French be providing any lectures? And, and I yes. guess I neglected to say, that's what we're most excited about is he will be on board the entire time and we will have times for lecturing on board. Yes, we are definitely gonna set up a time for him to talk probably within those first, um, that first day or so once we're on board. Right. Yep. Yes. Yep. So thank you all. Um, and again, um, I hope everybody who joined us for, via Zoom and via Facebook today enjoyed the presentation. Take the time to visit our webpage for more virtual opportunities. I will be back in November with another upcoming host, uh, Jared Frederick, who is the Assistant Professor of History from our Altoona campus, will be um, joining me for a presentation along with a representative from the National World War II Museum um, to talk about the Band of Brothers trip, Easy Company Tour, England to the Eagle's Nest. Um, again, our World War II trips are always very popular, so we're really excited that he's gonna be able to join us on that. For more information, um, to make a reservation for this trip, as we discussed today, or for any of our upcoming travel opportunities, you can visit our website at alumni.psu.edu backslash travel. Um, until next time, I hope to travel with you all soon and have a great night. Bye now. Thanks a lot. Bye.